The prohibition was a nationwide constitutional ban on the production, importation, transportation, and sale of alcoholic beverages from 1920 to 1933. The prohibition ended up leading to an increase of the illegal production and sale of liquor and an accompanying rise in gang violence and other crimes. This ultimately led to waning support for prohibition by the end of the 1920s. The prohibition was ended by the 21st Amendment passed in 1933. The, the Prohibition Movement largely began as a religious movement in the earth, early 19th century, spearheaded by Protestants, Methodists, and Progressive Reformers. By the mid-1800s, alcohol abuse had wreaked havoc on the lives of many women and inspired thousands of women to protest and organize politically for the cause of temperance. They founded the Women's Christian Temperance Union in 1873 and lobbied for local laws restricting alcohol and creating an alco anti-alcohol educational campaign that reached to many schools across the nation. Calls for prohibition became more common during the Progressive Era as activists sought to improve the negative social effects of rapid industrialization. Saloons and heavy drinking culture was associated with, with immigrants and members of the working class and were seen as detrimental to the values of Christian society. Later, the Anti-Saloon League, led by Wayne Wheeler, became one of the most successful lobbying organizations in American history, willing to form alliances with any organization that shared its sole goal, a constitutional amendment that would ban the manufacture, sale, and transportation of alcohol. As anti-German sentiment rose with the American entry into the First World War, anti-saloon propaganda effect effectively connected beer and brewers with Germans and trees it in the public mind. Man, it's been a long day at work, honey. I need to get my alcohol. Stop oh, drinking yeah. alcohol! What are you saying I shouldn't drink my alcohol? Maine passed the first state prohibition law in 1846, and a number of other states followed by the time the Civil War began in 1861. In 1917, after the U.S. entered World War One, President Woodrow Wilson instituted a temporary wartime prohibition in order to save grain for producing food. That same year, Congress submitted the 18th Amendment, which banned the manufacture, transportation, and sale of intoxicating liquors for state ratification. The amendment received support of the necessary three-quarters of U.S. states in just 11 months. In October 1919, Congress passed the National Prohibition Act, also known as the Volstead Act, which provided guidelines for the federal government of prohibition, which effectively started prohibition. In this political cartoon, the saloon is represented by the camel, and the straw on its back represents the votes for prohibition. The camel is still able to stand up even under the immense weight of all the votes for prohibition. The only thing that will break the saloon of the camel is a consistent vote and therefore added weight of each citizen. The artist writes at the bottom, vote as if your vote could be the last straw to break the camel's back. To tell people to treat vote as if it would be the one to topple the camel or destroy the saloons. Though alcohol consumption dropped between 30 to 50 percent, the prohibition also created a vast illegal market for the production, trafficking, and sale of alcohol. Both federal and local governments struggled to enforce prohibition over the course of the 1920s as they lacked the resources to consistently and effectively enforce prohibition. People who wanted to keep drinking found ever more inventive w ways to do so causing an increase of illegal manufacturing and sale of liquor known as bootlegging. The operation of speakeasies, stores, or nightclubs selling alcohol, and the smuggling of alcohol across state lines and the informal production of liquor known as moonshine or bathtub gin in private homes. The benefits that were predicted to come with the prohibition, such as increased rent due to the closing of saloons and larger crowds in movie theaters as Americans look for new ways to entertain themselves without alcohol, all failed to come true. Instead, the closing of breweries, distilleries, and saloons led to the elimination of thousands of jobs, and in turn, thousands more jobs were eliminated for barrel makers, truckers, waiters, and other related trades. Along with this, prohibition had a big effect on government tax revenues. Before prohibition, many states relied heavily on excise taxes and liquor sales to fund their budgets. In New York, almost 75% of the state's revenue was derived from 
liquor taxes. At the national level, prohibition cost the federal government a total of $11 billion in lost tax revenue, while costing over $300 million to enforce. Hey, what are you doing? Uh, is that a treat? See, no, this is just juice box. You're under arrest! Wait, no, don't take a hooch. We got a lot of money. Wow, that's more than my salary! I'll join the party! Here you go. Thanks. Yeah. Oh, good. Twelve seconds later. Six and a half hours later. Three days later. The Prohibition era, contrary to what many preceded, encouraged the rise of criminal activity associated with bootlegging. One notorious example is the Chicago gangster Al Capone, who earned around $60 million annually from bootlegging operations and speakeasies. Such illegal operations fueled a corresponding rise in gang violence, including the St. Valentine's Day Massacre in Chicago in 1929, in which several men dressed as policemen and believed to have been associated with Capone shot and killed a group of men in an enemy gang. The effects of prohibition on law enforcement were also negative. The sums of money being exchanged during the dry era proved a corrupting influence in both the Federal Bureau of Prohibition and at the state and local level. Police officers and prohibition agents alike were frequently tempted by bribes or the ludicrous opportunity to go into bootlegging themselves. Yo, there's this rival gang. The bottle liquors. Oh boy. They scammed us a millions of dollars. I want their leader killed. That's gonna cost some money, man. Five. Take it. Take oh, it. Yeah. Take it. Oh yeah. Oh yeah. Take it. Five. Hi. Hey, uh, I heard Usman was in this area. Yeah, man. Is that, is that, is I that think that's him. him. Oh wait, but dang, yeah. that dude looks like Ben Jin on a normal day. You sure this is the guy? Yeah, it's him. Okay. okay. We're stopping. Here. Mr. Ushman! Get over here, man. You scammed us millions of dollars. Uh, no. Get up here. You been drinking tonight, sir? Uh, no, officer. I just had a glass of dinner with my wine. Okay, I'm gonna need you to step out of the car and walk a straight line, please. Blacklock shows the lack of thought and possibly bad things could happen if people continue to excessively drink. Punch in life in this quote means alcohol and life go well together already, so how could anything go wrong? These are old attitudes taken on by America, specifically men, as alcohol was very abundant and many immigrants such as Germans also drank. Alcohol consumption was very high before the 1920s, reaching its peak at a truly outlandish 7 gallons of ethanol a year per person in the mid-1800s. This indulgence had many bad effects on society, such as the abuse of wives by their husbands. Nation explains the men who drink are generally bad people, constantly drinking and indulging in alcohol just about every day. When Nation says these men are right-eyed devils, she was relating to how others view these drinkers, specifically women who are steadily filing for more divorces than ever due to drinking. Nation explains the changing attitudes on alcohol and leads a new movement for the banning of alcohol. Groups advocating for the shutdown of Solana bars got their wish in 1919 when the prohibition started. On today's profit. And there's no money 
in here! <laughs> How delightful! <laughs>